Good morning, everyone, and welcome to day three of our Facebook or our lives, our Great Lakes Road Trips lives. Uh, if you've been following along with our passport, don't forget you can turn to page two and fill out because we're in Sudbury at Science North. And if you are filling out anything any teachers want to share with us, don't forget that we have our socials on the back page and you can post on Great Lakes Road Trip 2022. And if you have any questions today, fill out the Padlet that was linked in the email that was sent out to you yesterday. So my name is Christine. I am from the Turtle Island Conservation Program at your Toronto Zoo, and I'm here with Megan. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Science North. Here in Sudbury, we are on the traditional and ancestral lands of the Atikamishing, Anishinaabeg, and Wanapate First Nations. These lands sit in the Robinson Huron Treaty area. And I'd also like to acknowledge the Métis Nation of Ontario for their ongoing contributions in this area. Perfect. So I heard today that you have some four fantastic species in Ontario to show us. So uh, can we start off with the first species? Absolutely. I have a colleague with me, Katrina, today, and she's going to help us out with the first animal because he's quite active and quite lively. However, they're very common, but they're nocturnal. So they might not be an animal that you're super familiar with. This is Earl, everybody. He is a northern flying squirrel. And um, as I mentioned, they are like as common as chipmunks, but they are nocturnal and they have a lot of amazing adaptations for their nocturnal habitat or their nocturnal sort of behaviors. Um, you'll notice that Earl has quite large eyes that help him, <laughs> that help him out. Um, and then he has a really amazing ability to glide. So although they are called flying squirrels, um, they don't actively fly like a bird. They glide using a flap of skin that goes from their wrist to their ankle. And then they have a really cool flat tail that helps them in, uh, in their glide, so to help them steer. So we'll see if he wants to do a couple glides we're not sure. He may not want to, but I'll just pretend to be a tree. Oh. <laughs> Come on over, Earl. Hi. <laughs> what a great job. Yeah. And so considering a flying squirrel, I'm assuming that these would live in the high tree to treetops in forests. So where, uh, where could we find, find these animals? So you can actually find them all throughout the boreal forest. Mm -hmm. um, there are two species of flying squirrel in Ontario. This is the northern flying squirrel, and there's also the southern flying squirrel, but they're not nearly as common here in Ontario. Mm -hmm. um, but they're very common in the boreal forest, where there's lots of conifer um, trees and a lot of big trees to, to glide from. Um, so yeah, and they're, they are herbivores, so they are, sorry, omnivores. <laughs> so they eat both meat and plants. Um, so they'll eat sort of like little bugs and things that they find in trees and then lots of seeds um, and different kinds of fruits and leaves and all that mm -hmm. kind of jazz as well. Now, is there any risk to them in terms of um, predation up in these trees? Uh, and then as well as, is there human impact uh, towards their species? Absolutely, it's a great question. Um, so they do have some natural predators um, because they are nocturnal. Owls are typically their major predator um, because the nocturnal owls will feed on them. Um, and uh, habitat loss is is a really big one for these guys. Um, and as I did mention, the southern flying squirrel is not as common, and that's ma the main reason why, is because of habitat loss. Um, but uh, there's a lot more boreal forest than the, the southern sort of mixed forest. So yeah, but, but it, it, habitat loss is a big one. And I know this is always um, a question that we get asked, especially um, from our younger audience, and they want to know, can this be a pet? And I would say, why can't it be a pet? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, flying squirrels are really active at nighttime. We are diurnal animals, so our kind of our daily habits definitely don't quite mix. So they would be awake when you're trying to sleep. Um, but also, they are wild animals and therefore should remain in the wild. Absolutely. Earl came to us actually because somebody thought that he would make a good pet and very quickly realized that he wasn't. And he had several health concerns when we did adopt him, eventually because he wasn't being cared for appropriately. Mm -hmm. All right, well, Earl looks like he's getting a little sleepy, wants to hide <laughs> in the pocket. So uh, maybe we can go on to the next. Uh, Absolutely. 
So this is the only mammal that I had to show you for today. The rest of them um, are all reptiles. That is my favorite. I do work with Adopt-a-Pond at the Toronto Zoo, uh, and that is our program where we work with species of reptiles and amphibians in Ontario, specifically at risk species. So I'm very excited today to see all your reptiles. Awesome. So our first a turtle is one of Ontario's smallest. Thank you, Katrina. It's one of Ontario's smallest turtles. Not the smallest, I would argue, but definitely one of the smallest. So this is an adult stink pot turtle. They also have another name called an Eastern musk turtle. I like to call them stink pot turtles just because it's way funnier to say. Um, and they get that name because they have several glands um, near their tail at the bottom of their shell that produce a really stinky musky smell. Um, so that's where that name stink pot comes from. And uh, yeah, they're fantastic little turtles. They, be, even though they are quite small, they do live in larger bodies of water. They can be found found in smaller ones as well. Um, but you'll notice he's. This is Erno, everybody, mm -hmm. <laughs> and Erno is demonstrating uh, his lovely long neck here, or her lovely, lo lovely long neck, excuse me. Um, and, uh, oh, now she's not. <laughs> um, so they do love to live in aquatic habitats. They don't come out on land very often, like some of our other species of turtle. Yeah, yeah it's fantastic. Uh, and as you kind of mentioned, their musky smell, uh, which is hence where they get their name, uh, can you tell us a little bit about that and uh, why they might have that smell? That's a great question. So they basically use that musk to startle predators away from them as they are a smaller species of turtle. There are a number of things that might try and eat this guy. Um, any any larger, um, uh, any like, large mammal that lives in or near the water, birds will try and eat these guys, raccoons, foxes, if they do catch them in the shallow water um, or in, um, in the basking area or something like that. Uh, so that musky smell is quite startling to animals that have a good sense of smell mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it gives them a chance to scoot away into the water before mm -hmm. they can get eaten. And um, so there's eight species of turtles in Ontario and all of these species are at risk. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit about the at risk status of this turtle and why it is at risk? Yeah, so stink pot turtles are listed as special concern here in Ontario. And the main reason is due to, again, habitat loss is a big one. Um, you know, other pollutants in the water is a big one, but also the pet trade. Sadly, because uh, this is a very small species a turtle um, sometimes they are collected to be illegally sold as pets so um, because they stay quite small um, but turtles actually make terrible pets if I'm honest uh, they live for a really long time they're kind of stinky I mean his name is a stink pot turtle uh, yeah and and they're not they're not great pets to have in the first I place I definitely agree with that uh, I have the pleasure of working in uh, going into the wild and doing turtle monitoring efforts uh, however we do have a Blandings turtle head starting program at Toronto Zoo uh, and then that's where we keep them for two years raised in the zoo and we release them back into the wild but for these two years they are in captivity and I have been there cleaning their tanks and they are stinky <laughs> so I can attest to that. <laughs> Awesome. What a cute little face on this guy. I love too the, the little projections on the bottom of the chin that help them find food buried in the mud. They kind of help us. It's a little extra sense for them. And um, what kind as of food would it be eating? Yeah, so they, turtles are very... Um, more of a scavenger. They're they're not picky eaters at all. They'll eat whatever they can find. Um, definitely like mollusks, so like snails and things like that in the water. Small fish and other invertebrates for sure. Um, but they'll also eat vegetation as well. So like under like aquatic vegetation. Yeah. Perfect. All right. Well, this guy is adorable. How about <laughs> we go on to the next? Species? Yeah. Absolutely. I'm just gonna sanitize my hands. Thank you, Katrina. So we're going to move in to or move on to a different group of reptiles for the next one, um, which will be a snake, mm -hmm. um, and it will be femur, our fox snake. So she's our awesome. adult fox snake. Um, we do have two fox snakes that are adults and two juveniles here at Science North, um, and she's a mother, which is kind of cool. So the two young ones that we do have actually are her offspring along with our male which is kind of amazing now so. snakes have two ways of um, I guess giving birth you might know that they 
um, lay eggs um, and those are later hatched into baby snakes um, but some snakes Thank also you. give birth live what um, do fox snakes do that's great so they lay eggs so this is an egg laying snake so here she is this is femur She's quite a dark coloration, um, but the way that you identify this species is usually by the color. Um, they often have a like orangish tinge to the to their faces. Um, so hers is not very obvious, but it is there. Uh, and then they have this dark brown saddle markings all the way down their back, and then a lighter belly um, with the sort of checkered checkered belly there, which is kind of amazing. Now, one of my favorite things about a few different species of snakes, and maybe you can talk about the false rattle, and maybe if we can have Annie come over, here's the Eastern Massasauga rattlesnake, uh, and you can see a kind of similarity in pattern uh, compared to the fox snake. So there is um, an overlap in some areas where they live, and it could be hard to distinguish and actually they've developed a way to sound like a rattlesnake. Maybe you can talk about that. Absolutely. So you'll notice if you take a look at the tail of the fox snake, there's no rattle. Um, sadly, our rattlesnake is sitting on his rattle so you can't <laughs> see it. Uh, but it, it, there's no rattle on this tail. It's a long tapered with a pointy tip um, on their tail. And, but they will vibrate their tail really, really fast. Um, usually hitting a rock or under some leaves or brush and it makes a very similar sound to mm -hmm. a rattlesnake which mimics them and then ultimately that scares away a predator that thinks that it might be a rattlesnake. Yeah and the other species that does this is a milk snake and I actually witnessed that live and it was super cool. It was out in the Rouge National Urban Park with some leaf litter and it sounds exactly like that buzzing rattle of a rattlesnake. Yeah. But um, the rattlesnake is the only venomous snake in Ontario, um, so these guys are non-venomous and they are quite lovely and you can just see uh, the fox snakes are, just have such a great nature. They do, they really do. And yeah, non-venomous, so this, is, this type of snake is a constrictor. So it would squeeze its prey to kill it and it mainly eats rodents. So all kinds of different rodents um, and it will be found near water sometimes not usually in the water but they like to live in sort of wetlandy um, and then grassland areas as well and i know there is a bad stigma against snakes so uh, maybe you can share what your favorite facts about snakes and why they are i i believe they're quite cute and they're fantastic animals for our environment absolutely they're really important predators right um so they help to control different populations of you know animals that we consider pests like, like mice and things like that. Uh, one of my favorite snake facts though that I love telling everybody, and femur is very well, d like just demonstrating it, um, is the snake tongue. So they have an amazing sense of smell, but they don't smell the same way that you and I do. They use their tongues. Um, and so what, every time she sticks her tongue out, she's gathering all kinds of amazing smells on there. And then she sticks her tongue in her mouth and then there's a hole on the top, on the roof of her mouth. She sticks that tongue up there and it's called a Jacobson's organ. And it's an amazing adaptation that snakes have. So femur is smelling things on me that I definitely can't smell. And I hope I don't smell bad, but um, <laughs> yeah. So one of my favorite snake facts. Yeah, she's definitely curious about kind of us being around here yeah. since we're new people. Uh, so she's just kind of checking out her environment and, and who's looking at her and it's you guys. <laughs> Fantastic. She's a beautiful snake and, and can you tell us a little bit about the coloration and maybe how to tell, identify it? Yeah, so um, the, the, the main thing with these guys is, is on the head and the face. So again, there's that usually that orange tinge and then you'll notice that there's a bit of a dark spot below the eye um, that is an identifying feature for <laughs> she doesn't want to show you um, for these guys as well um, as well as the the dark brown spots but they do col they do come in a lot of different colors from like a tan um, to like a darker brown like she is so um, some of our other fox snakes are actually quite light in comparison to fantastic. her fantastic yeah and um, I have witnessed this but they have a fantastic climbing ability so where do they kind of live and do they have that ability to climb in the trees you know I think most snakes can climb yeah. definitely um, I personally I have never encountered a wild a fox snake um, but to but they do like to like 
um, climb probably like shorter trees. I don't know how arboreal that mm -hmm. they usually are, but yeah. But they're quite neat because they can they can swim, they can climb. Yeah. They have fantastic ability and those strong muscles. Highly adapted animal. Yeah. All right. Um, I guess we can go on to our last. Yes, animal, our last animal heard, is a snapping turtle, and I love snapping turtles. I've had the pleasure yes. to uh, to see some in the wild and handle them. And uh, I've had a big giant snapping turtle this large, some smaller ones. So I'm interested to see today what we have. So we're just gonna take a moment to let her out and we're kind of gonna go down to the ground to meet her. She's go. probably gonna move, so. We'll see if she we'll see if she takes a rest. Beautiful. But she is. So this is Mikinak, um, and Mikinak actually means uh, snapping turtle or great turtle in Ojibwe. Um, and uh, yeah, so she is an amazing animal. Um, we actually ad adopted her um, because she's blind, so she has no eyes, so which means that she can't live on her own in the wild. Um, but she's a fabulous snapping turtle, and definitely the way that you saw me pick her up just now by the sides of her shell is not safe handling if you ever need to. <laughs> Move a turtle from the road, yeah. um, which I think is what we wanted to chat about yeah. uh, for for her for sure. So, turtles um, in Ontario are species at risk. This is a special concern species, and the major one of the major things that impact turtles is road mortality, which means that they get hit by cars on the road. And usually, these are female; these are girl turtles going to lay their eggs in the spring. Mm -hmm. um, so. One thing that we can do to help is by removing them from the road and helping to get them off the road so that they don't get hit by cars and to be vigilant when we're driving mm -hmm. in areas that they do, um, that we see those big signs that say turtle crossing. Yeah, and I think snapping turtles definitely get a bad rap because of this snap and people are worried they're gonna bite. From my experience, it's always out of fear. Um, they're never going to purposefully attack you. And that's because a lot of turtles have um, a shell that they can fully close into, or at least mostly close into, but snapping turtles don't have that ability, so they're not protected, and that's why they snap out. So it's not out of something that's aggressive, it's just as a defense mechanism. Absolutely. So um, if you ever do need to handle a snapping turtle, there are a couple of safe ways to do that especially if you're removing them from the road usually all you have to do is lift up the back of the shell <laughs> and they'll start on their way there she's coming towards you guys <laughs> come back this way all right the other way that you can do it is by grabbing the base of the tail putting your hand underneath the plastron and picking them up this way miki is a very large turtle though She's quite heavy, so I don't recommend you do that if she's a very large turtle mm -hmm. like her. Yeah, and as you can see here, if you encountered one in the wild, you might even be able to kind of usher it across the road instead of trying to pick it up. Exactly. She is beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, and one of my favorite things about snapping turtles is this really, really long tail. That's their biggest defining characteristic. Mm -hmm. um, if you see a turtle with spikes on his tail and it's really long, definitely a turtle. Yeah, a in Ontario, turtle. there's nothing quite like the snapper here, which is the sheer size and this kind of dinosaur looking prehistoric creature, which is really cool. Um, I guess not to be confused with the alligator snapping turtle, yes. which is in the States. Yes, exactly. Common snapping turtle. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Hello, sweetie pie. She's trying to see who's over here. I'm not familiar to her, so she's just going to take a look. <laughs> she's um, so smelling you for sure. Yeah, so I guess we're going to kind of approach the question period. So would you like to share anything about Science North as a wrap-up? Oh, my gosh. Okay. Um, 
Well, Science North is um, the second largest science center in Canada, which is um, which is pretty amazing that we're all the way up here in Sudbury, and uh, we are open to the public um, right now uh, three days a week uh, on Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays from 10 to 4. So definitely come and visit us if you haven't had the chance yet. Um, but yeah, we we love sharing our passion for science here on the third floor, which is where all of our animal ambassadors live. We absolutely we love sharing them with everybody um, and having people the, uh, giving giving everyone the opportunity to meet them um, and see them doing some cool behaviors. Just go on a walk. Yeah, she's just gonna walk away from us now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, as she's walking away, uh, if we have any questions, uh, maybe we can go ahead and take them. Yeah. So from Mr. Perez's class in Toronto, I believe that we are coming back to the flying squirrel. What is their natural habitat? So what is the flying squirrel's natural habitat if you can't hear? Um, okay, so the, their natural habitat is definitely um, dense boreal forest. Uh, so definitely where there are lots of trees and heavily forested areas, uh, but you have to be uh, available at nighttime to see them because that's when they're active. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, oh, go ahead. Also about the flying squirrel, follow up. How long do they live for? Oh, that's a fantastic question. Sadly, they don't have very long lifespans as a small rodent, so they usually live to be about three to four years. So not terribly long time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, wrapping up our trio of questions on the squirrel, um, not sure if you answered this, but are they at risk here in Ontario? No, they're not. So the northern flying squirrel is not at risk in Ontario. All right, moving on to our next star, the uh, stink pot. Uh, they wanted to know, that little turtle, was that a baby or fully grown? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah. That is a fully grown stink pot turtle. Yeah, so when they're, when they're small, when they're just little hatchlings, they're like the size of like a loony. <laughs> they're very, very, very small. Um, but that is a fully grown adult turtle. Yeah. Okay, and now moving on to snakes. Um, is it often that humans are confused about venomous snakes here in Ontario and are hurt or killed? Does that happen often? That's a really good question. So, um, to the information that I have, very few people in Ontario actually are bitten by a mass dog or rattlesnake. Yeah. It's definitely under a dozen people a year. Um, but the last person that died on record was actually over 70 years ago. Mm -hmm. It's a very long time um, because although they are venomous and they are considered a medical emergency, so if you're ever bitten, you should seek medical attention, they're not deadly. So they're, they're still going to the hospital, but chances are you'll be quite all right, um, especially if uh, you, um, uh, sorry, I was gonna say that the that adults can actually control how much venom that they inject, if they inject any venom at all. So even if you are bit, there's a chance that you could get a dry bite, mm -hmm. which is kind of a neat adaptation because they don't want to waste their venom. Yeah, and definitely, uh, I think there is that stigma um, with a lot of people that uh, these, Snakes are scary, and considering it's such a low risk of getting bitten by a massasauga, they're really quiet snakes. They mm -hmm. don't want, they're not actively looking to bite people. They're wanting to hide, and they use that as a defense again. Um, so if you um, can spread the word, definitely spread the word about how great snakes are, and they're not scary. Um, if anything, they're scared of you. Um, so if you can just treat them with respect, uh, kind of keep your distance, uh, and then spread the word that snakes are great, and they're cute. And I love them. <laughs> They're fabulous animals. Yeah. Uh, this is a series of questions about your relationship with the animals here at Science North. Are most of them rescued or born here? Do they get used to people like you who handle and feed them? And do they form attachments to, uh, you know, those of you in blue coats? Yeah, those are great questions. So. All of the animals we have here at Science North um, come to us because they cannot live in the wild for some reason or another. So either they were born in human care at another zoo or another facility, um, or they were rescued um, in terms of they were um, confiscated because they were being sold as illegal pets. 
Some of them, like Mikinak, was it, were injured in the wild and couldn't remain living in the wild because it would have been difficult for her to continue surviving there. Um, and they do get used to us in a sense that we handle them all the time. Um, we have a relatively small collection of animals compared to all of the animals you have at the Toronto Zoo. So it's definitely a lot easier for us to handle them and get a little bit closer to them. Uh, just because of the nature of what they are. They're mm -hmm. small mammals, reptiles, and amphibians. Um, I don't know if they form any attachments, of course. I, I can't speak for them. Um, but uh, we like to think that they at least recognize our blue coats. from, And some of our turtles especially definitely know that if you're wearing blue, that you're likely to get some food. <laughs> um, I, I don't know the answer to this one. Why don't snakes have legs? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, okay, so <laughs> um, why don't they have legs? It, it, the simple answer is because they don't need them. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so snakes and lizards share a common ancestor. So whatever their ancestor looked like a long time ago would have had legs because there is some evidence that um, in some snakes like boas and pythons, they have remnants mm -hmm. of what used to be little legs. Um, but many of our, our snakes here in Ontario, because they're from a different family of snakes, um, they don't have those sort of little evidence anymore, um, but definitely they're, they're still closely related. So, but they do just well without them. Yeah. They, can, they can climb, they can swim, they can get food. They don't need them, so they don't have them. <laughs> Right, I'm going to come at you with a series of numbers questions. Oh boy. Okay. How many animals do you have at Science North? Okay. How many reptiles? Okay. How many flying squirrels? Okay. How many fish? Okay. Well, I, okay. We so have the numbers, apparently, numbers. so we have a five fish. So we have a small mouth or large mouth bass. Oh, I'm getting, Katrina's telling me that we have eight. <laughs> I'm forgetting. What's that? Individuals, yes, individuals. So we have three species represented, no, four species represented, sorry, I was forgetting the bullheads. We have brown bullheads, largemouth bass, um, a um, rock bass, and a, no, a pumpkin seed, sorry. We thought he was a rock bass. Whoop, we were wrong. <laughs> uh, and some white suckers. Yeah. We only have one flying squirrel right now. Our Earl is our only flying squirrel. Um, how many reptiles we have? Like individuals or number of reptiles? We don't know. Okay, well, we have, we have five out of the eight species of turtle. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have um, the Massasauga rattlesnake. We have the fox snakes, milk snakes, gray rat snakes, garter snake, and water snakes. So we're missing a couple species of snake, definitely some of the smaller t species. And how many animals in total? I haven't counted them in a minute, um, but there is somewhere between 80 and 100, mm -hmm. like if you count each individual. All right, we're approaching the end, so maybe we'll take a couple more questions or one big question. Okay, I have two more turtle questions. Okay. Turtle big hit. How deep can a snapping turtle swim? How deep? How deep do they go? I don't hmm. know. They definitely are more of a like shallow water mm -hmm. snake, uh, snake, <laughs> not snake, turtle, um, because they don't come out on land very often they really need that shallow water to bask and to bring their body temperature back up um, so you'll often see them sort of if they're in big lakes which you definitely find them there you'll find them swimming at the surface mm -hmm. or you'll find them in the shallower areas under leaf litter yeah. under under the mud and stuff like that um, so I don't know but I can tell you that they can hold their breath for a very long time I once timed Miki Nak to see how long she could stand her, and she was almost under there for like um, a half an hour. Wow. So, can I sneak a question in? Yeah. Is it true that snapping turtles breathe out of their butts? <laughs> All turtles can breathe out of their butts. Yeah. They do this during hibernation, which is pretty amazing. Um, the skin around their cloaca, which is like a fancy science word for their butt, um, is uh, very thin, and so they can absorb oxygen through that skin while they're overwintering in the winter time, which is very cool. All right, one more question. One more question. This is again from Mr. Perez's class in Toronto. Uh, do we know why the snapping turtle went blind? Did it happen uh, an accident or was it born that way? That's a fabulous question. And the answer is we actually don't know. She was found by a local group of scientists that were doing turtle surveys here in Sudbury. And they found two snapping turtles that were both blind. It does look like she had eyes at some point 
So it could be a parasite, could have been genetics, could have been a predator um, or something environmental. Um, but since then, they haven't found any other ones. So we're not quite sure. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. It's my pleasure. Yeah, fantastic. And reminder that tomorrow uh, we'll be here again at 11 a.m. Uh, so check us out and uh, see you tomorrow. Bye. Bye.